My name is David Ainsworth. I'm with the Secretary to the Convention on Biological Diversity, and welcome here to Nature Day at UNFCCC's COP26 here in Glasgow. We're coming to you today from the Jeff GCF Pavilion, uh, and uh, this event that you're going to see is uh, part of the Real Conventions Pavilion module within the Jeff GCF. The Jeff and GCF, of course, are the agencies that support activities under the UNFCCC, the UNCCD, uh, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. So today, uh, you know, in keeping with Nature Day, we're going to have an event uh, with people here on site and remotely uh, talking about supporting a decade of action on ecosystem restoration. Uh, as you know, the decade of ecosystem restoration uh, begins now, uh, this year, and it's 10 years of activities uh, that will support not just uh, objectives under um, the UNFCCC and that, but also under the Convention of Biodiversity and the UNCCD as well. So restoration represents an activity that covers everything. Um, we've got a diverse group of experts present here on site. Uh, and remotely, and we're going to look at the per different perspectives on restoration, the benefits of it, uh, and the need to address these issues holistically uh, using ecologically sound principles. Uh, so I will introduce the speakers one at a time as they, they give their presentations, because we actually have a number of people online and we want to make sure we move forward here. Uh, but you are going to hear from representatives of the conventions, uh, representatives from UNESCO. Uh, you're going to hear an outline of the platform for the ecosystem restoration, um, the, the link of it with the post 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, and then some of the support also under the Forest Ecosystem Restoration Initiative. We'll hear some national examples and different perspectives on tackling restoration by eliminating invasives, and then the marine realm uh, challenges as well. So. Overall, we're hoping that we'll have a great discussion about the important role of restoration, uh, the realization of multiple benefits, and the different pathways that it offers to resilience and to recovery. So we've got a packed schedule. I'll get started. And uh, we're going to start here with Chris Buss, who's with us. Chris is director of the Climate and Finance Center at IUCN, and he's going to be talking on behalf of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And he's going to be looking at the role of the uh, decade in supporting a 10-year program for global ecosystem restoration. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, David, and, and, th and thank you for the organizing this and the opportunity to speak um, on behalf of the, of, <clears throat> of, the, of the partners for the UN Decade. Um, I'm, uh, if we, are you able to put the slides up? Uh, fantastic. Um, so it's, I actually was just coming from the Marrakesh Partnership Land Use event and, and, and another event that they're talking about the Decade of Action, and I think what is really exciting is that they, what we're hearing now is the nature and climate links and the need for accelerated action over the next 10 years. So the UN decade is perfectly placed to, to help deliver that and, and in relation to restoration of ecosystems. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to go through some slides and I apologize on, on Nature Day, you get, a, there's a lot going on. So I do have to, I do have to leave promptly after, after presenting, but I'm sure there's, there's, from what I've seen of the program, there's a lot of great things to, to be seen. So, so, um, yeah, the, the the decade comes is built on many many things, and it, it's it's not just a yeah, what what wasn't coming out of out of the blue. It, it was it was it was building on the work that has been done by many, many of the partners that are involved, um, and it's aligning with the other Rio conventions. Builds on the work of the forest landscape restoration approach, but then starts bringing in other ecosystems, oceans, wetlands, etc. Um, and 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 as 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 David, as you said, it's really out. So it's it's really des designed to to deliver the Paris Agreement, the land degradation, net neutrality targets, the biodiversity targets, Initiative 2020, Bond Challenge targets, etc. There's a suite of targets in, in, a, in, a, in a global framework that was approved in, in globally at the UN General Assembly in 2019. So it has a lot of political backing, but also a lot of um, experience and, and knowledge behind it. And, and you know, I think for the partners, it's really bringing that together to, to raise the, 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 the profile of restoration, the role of restoration, but also the opportunities that it presents. Um, it was it was launched um, on Environmental Day 2021, and I mean so, some of the figures that you you can see there is it, uh, in in China there was 130 million hashtags, there was a, a thousand publications in the week of that the, the launch were were were, were published, and the, the, the figures have been phenomenal, and and I think that's a real. 
that to me demonstrates a real understanding of the need for restoration. You know, we, 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 for many years, we heard the words, we must protect our forest resources, we must protect our wetlands, but now it's protect and restore. They, they go hand in hand, and I think, you know, seeing, that, seeing the launch of the decade and seeing that so much was, was publicised about it, and there's been so many publications. So it's not just the public, it's not just the, the social media. You know, these days, we're all hung up on the social media and, and, and getting those hashtags out, but it's also, it was, it was, it was a quality of, of publications around that. So the scientific underpinning was, was there as well, and I think that is, that, that's what also makes this extremely exciting. Um, it, it's based around three goals um, of, of, of driving um, global, national, regional commitments and increasing the understanding and knowledge of, of our systems. So it's not just, it's just, it's not just about you know, implementation on the ground, that the actual decade consortia is, is also looking at our knowledge and what we're doing and producing, but also making sure that we're, we're educating and, and using that knowledge beyond, beyond our, uh, our sectors. And I think that's what's, what, what is quite critical. I think you know, there's still a sort of framing of working within ourselves and working, talking to ourselves. But what we're trying to really push now is, is get beyond the different sectors. So we're restoring. And what are we restoring for? Yes, we're restoring for, for biodiversity. That's why, you know, why we're sat here now. But we, we all know that it's not just, we're not just the ecosystem restoration for biodiversity. It's also that we're looking for the multiple benefits that, that restoration, that restoration can, can achieve. So it, it, it's set up within a, within a partnership framework of lead agencies, UNEP and FAO. It's the UN decade of, of restoration. But there's a lot of core collaborating U, UN agencies in that, the CBD, UNCCD, in support of that. IUCN are one of the core partners um, based on our role and our international observer recognition. But then as, as, as this evolves, then there'll be supporting partners, restoration implementers, and voices, getting those, those voices raised and, and presented. So, and that, and the, the financing mechanism for that is through a multi-partner trust fund, so enabling that flow of funds to come into this work and, and, and allow it to, to facilitate, facilitate the drive of, the, of, the, of those three key pillars for, for technical support, implementation support, and, and communication support. Um, and, and then when we're looking at partners, you know, we, some of the, a, a great raft of partners and I think as as you go around many of these events that's what we're seeing we are seeing this partnership sometimes it looks as though we're competing against each other at different initiatives but you know, we are working together there is UNDP there is the World Economic Forum um, there is the Great Green Wall there, then there's private sector partners such as Unilever there's many organizations that are now getting behind this and supporting it and understanding the value and role of, of, of restoration in there, both, both, both as, a, as, a, as a strategy for the public sector, but also for the private sector, um, both, both within their supply chains and outside of their supply chains. So just giving a, a bit, of, bit of context on that, there's the, there's, as well as the, the, the lead that UNEP and FAO are applying as, as a strategic, as a strategic leading a strategic group and core team. There's an advisory board. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a panel looking at humans in nature and the role of nature, but then there's a the role of task force. And I'll just touch on some of those task forces that we've, we've established so far to around science, best practices, the monitoring, the finance and youth engagement. Um, I think, you know, if you, if the, the, the thrust yesterday on youth, um, as well as on oceans and, and, and water, was a, was a big day here, and I think some of the representation of youth was, was fantastic, and, and we're seeing that more and more, and they, they, are a, they are a core group we want to bring into the, to more of the decade. So, one of the key things that we're working on as, as, as IUCN is the, is, the, is the science task force. And I, I've been in forest landscape restoration for with IUCN for 12 years and, and even that before then when I was working in the field in Africa. Um, and, and one of the biggest challenges is, is that articulation that, and, and of the quality assurance. People, in the forest landscape restoration, people just think, oh, it's of the forest or it's the restoration, but they don't look at the whole package. And I think, so what we're trying to do is, in the science, to, and, and then that's where you get the challenges and the, uh, the critiques, and, and which is right because it keeps us on our toes, but the, so the scientific advisory board is looking at, well, what is high quality ecosystem restoration? What does it look like on the ground? And how do we scale that up to learn, learn from the challenges and making sure we really, really address that? And, and the scientific underpinning of, a, of our strategies. So, you know, we're not just, 
planting eucalyptus trees in the wrong place, that we're actually doing the right thing at the right place, um, and that, that it's underpinned by, by science. Um, and then there's a task force on monitoring, which is, which is um, a, a, a large partnership. I think I'll just sort of focus on the bottom one there at the bottom with the Global Reef Restoration Observatory, ETH Zurich, w, w, World Economic Forum, WRI, and, and IUCN. We've all done a lot of restoration work in different components, right from the, the granularity detail of what does that look on, like on the ground and the challenges of getting that, and then the challenges of being able to use modern technology to expand that, but also then through to tools like the Restoration Barometer, which is helping governments and countries understand their enabling conditions, but also then their delivery conditions. So looking at what is the, what's the policy conditions, what's the finance mobilization, what's the capacity to deliver, and then what are you delivering in relation to livelihoods, in relation to um, in relation to actual spatial land uh, uh, restored and also the economic returns in, in relation to that. And, then, and we're also looking at the biodiversity returns and making sure that we are, we are integrating that into, into, the, into, the, into the process. Um, and so, so, so far, you know, this is, this is it's, a, it's a kickoff year. Um, there's uh, principles for ecosystem restoration. There's 10 principles that have been pu uh, published and looking at that across all, all sectors and biomes. Um, the capacity needs assessment. So if we're kicking off this decade, what do we need to do? What do we need to support to actually mobilize, mobilize action? And then capturing of good practices. So this is part of the driver of this is there's been many initiatives that are, do have momentum to, to drive this forward. Um, and then there's a big communication campaign as well. What are we, what are we, what, why, is, why are we restoring? What are we restoring for? Um, so from to communicating for action on commitments, uh, we've, we've seen a, a raft of commitments from governments. Now we need to see those moved from act to action. And that's not just gonna be action from the governments, it's gonna be action from non-state actors. And if you just take one example in Africa, the, the land, 75% of degraded land is on the forest and farm interface. So that's the way we've got to build the capacity of farmers to be able to deliver that and understanding. And, and, so, and, then, and then in that is making sure that, that the actions are, uh, are tangible and, and that we can move forward and we can make sure that, those, that what we're trying to do is, is feasible to be done on the ground. And then also looking at that, how do we mobilize that globally, a global campaign to really resonate with what we're doing. So we're not just looking at the global south, we're looking at the global north as well, of how we, how we can restore that and different, different ecosystems in different, different countries and regions of the world. Um, so how are we, how are we, how are we communicating? Um, through many engagement channels uh, that are, that are you know, so the social media, using cre creative communications, but also building up partnerships around this. And I think one of the things we do have now, what is really coming is, is there's, there's a lot of skillful and talented people out there to, to, at all different levels, whether it be farm, farmer, farm radio, whether it be global you know, campaigns for indigenous peoples, that we, we there's a, there's a raft of information that we can do to make sure that it's targeted and make sure that we're targeting the right people at the right place and the, on the right issues. Um, and, and part of that is, 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 the, is the digital hub that we're, we're, we're building to help capture the store, one, to promote our stories, but to also help capture what we're, do, what we're doing and what needs to be done and the best, best practices, etc. cetera. Um, and so going into, going into 20, 2022, uh, we've, we've, we're looking at different flagships about how we can actually start driving restoration and building up those, the, the, the momentum to, to do that. So uh, I, I think where, where we're positioned is fantastic. It's a great, it's the beginning of the decade, but it's a big decade of action. And we've always said that, and that's the message that's coming through here. So, so thank you for just giving time to present the, the overall framework of the decade and how it's working and how it's set up. And, uh, and I wish you, now you're getting into, into the interesting technical stuff and I'm sorry I'm not gonna be able to stay, but uh, I wish you the best of luck for the rest of the session, David. Great. Excellent, thanks very much, Chris. A round of applause for
Chris. Thank you so much for presenting that. I mean, it, the, the thing that's been impressive and I've seen, because I take it from the communications perspective, is looking at the attempt to communicate at different levels with different stakeholders and the notion of action. So it's a decade of action. The framework set into place, but rather than waiting years to move forward, it's already happening. So thanks for giving us that overview. Best of luck with the other events on this busy nature day. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks, okay, take care. Very good. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so our next presenter, uh, oh, good, oh, we have another guest, perfect. <laughs> good stuff, good timing, good, good. In and out, moving around. Good, so I want to see if, uh, I'm going to turn to the people at the technical panel. Has Louise joined us? Is she online in the Zoom? I'm going to look over at our, our tech team. She's okay? Perfect, good. So uh, Louise Baker is not able to join us on site, but she has uh, decided that she can connect with us uh, virtually, so she'll come on the screen. So Louise Baker is the managing director of the Global Mechanism for the Secretary of the UNCCD. And so she's going to talk to us a little bit about the relevant work that's taking place for uh, restoration under the UNCCD, in including Red Plus and also the Peace Forest, uh, Peace Forest Initiative. So, Louise, uh, you're there online. Uh, the floor is yours. I, Go ahead. Thank you, David. I am. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there. I was there today, but I started sneezing, so I decided to leave um, to not share whatever I picked up. Um, I hope it's nothing serious. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to join you. Um, UNCCD takes restoration very, very seriously. Uh, we have 128 countries who have committed to set their land degradation neutrality targets, their voluntary targets under UNCCD. And else, um, LDN really is, there's three elements to it, avoiding degradation, sustainable management and restoration. And working with our colleagues at PBL, uh, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, we had a really interesting breakthrough, I think, it, kind of technically when they plotted out the kind of scale of the commitments under LDN, but also under Bond Challenge, under NDCs. And there was, there are um, a billion hectares globally of land of terrestrial ecosystems that have been committed more or less for restoration activities. This is a huge amount of commitment from governments, but as, as was said before, we really need to now turn that into action. Um, from the global mechanism side, uh, the kind of developments that are happening, I suppose, we have been um, asked to uh, be the accelerator of the Great Green Wall Initiative. That's really accompanying the Pan-African Agency of the Great Green Wall and trying to sort of monitor and track and put funding partners and implementers together to accelerate action on the ground for the Great Green Wall, which is one of our flagship programs and certainly one of the flagship programs for the decade that I think everybody can rally around. It's, it's an incredibly ambitious initiative to restore 100 million hectares across Africa from Senegal to Djibouti. Um, to create 10 million jobs and store 250 million tons of carbon. So it's really a, an inspiring African initiative for restoration that we really all should get behind, I think. Um, so that's kind of one of our flagships, but it's certainly not the only one. And there, what, what we're finding is that there's um, both a need, and actually that's quite exciting, that for the first time, I think people are putting serious amount of investment towards the restoration agenda. There, so we have demand, we have resources. I think the question now is whether we can develop a pipeline of bankable projects, of projects that really deliver on this restoration agenda and deliver multiple benefits. So a lot of the work we're trying to do now is trying to build a partnership for this project preparation to get the money where it needs to be on the ground to implement the implement the restoration initiatives. Um, we, because it's such a fundamental part of our, um, kind of our DNA, I suppose, the restoration of terrestrial ecosystems, it's something that we we're, we're taking very seriously and um, we have been engaging as well through the G20 initiative and are also very happy to uh, be the host of a G20 initiative on reducing land degradation and um, conserving terrestrial ecosystems, which has also got a large component of restoration in it. All of these dates are aligning um, with this whole decade of action. And I think that really we've, we've come to a moment where. Um, everything is coming together if we can make it work. I think it's, it, we are in a position now where 
opportunity is there, it's ours to lose. So I think let's not lose it. Let's ensure the momentum for restoration really takes, takes place at local level, at national level, where we've got a lot of bottlenecks to really good restoration projects taking place are overcome whether that's taxes, incentives and subsidies, whether it's the enabling environment for governance, um, those things need to be overcome. Um, but at local level, at national level and, and at global level, it, it is all, I hope, coming together. So um, very exciting stuff. You mentioned both RED and the Peace Forest Initiative. I'm, I'm not much of an expert on RED, but on the Peace Forest Initiative, that's also a very interesting one. It's a new initiative that will be coming, that will be cross-border restoration initiatives that actually in a similar way that management of water resources has been a tool to either either for conflict or for peace building there's a real sense that the restoration agenda could go in that direction as well that communities could sh share restore and build the resources together to build peace so i think we're very excited about that one as well and, and there'll be more to come on that as it as it gets launched so there we go thank you i'll stop there and i look forward to hearing about everything else that's going on and being part of an exciting decade thank you louise thanks thanks very much yeah, thank you, Louise. I mean, there already are practical examples under the UNCCD uh, that, that tie up with restoration activities. You know, they mentioned the Great Green Wall. Uh, and just a quick comment about the Peace Force Initiative. I mean, under the CBD, there's a lot of work on the potential of restoration and cross-border activities to generate both peace and biodiversity dividends. So, great. Thanks so much, Louise, for that. So, we're going to continue our uh, remote connections uh, and continue our travel around the world of the United Nations system. Our next speaker is uh, Guy de, uh, de Bonnet, who is the Chief of the Natural Heritage Union. Unit, uh, of the World Heritage Center of UNESCO. So he's going to talk to us about ecosystem restoration taking place in UNESCO uh, designated sites. Uh, and this is a way uh, he'll talk to us about how this is a win-win situation, how we have activities that look for supporting and restoring biodiversity, but also addressing climate change. So Guy, I'm presuming you're with us. Go ahead and say hello and let's uh, yes, hear from I you. I hope you can hear me. You, you can sure hear can. us. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much, David. And thank you for having UNESCO at this uh, important event. We are very excited to be with you, even if it's from a, a distance. Uh, could we have the presentation, please? This is, oh yes, so this is, will be, this will be uh, uh, De Bonnet. Sorry, the techs are just getting the presentation up there, Guy. Yes, thank you. We had, we had quite a mixture. There are a lot of different slide decks that we're working with with today's event. Oh, that one doesn't show up on the list? Uh oh. So, sorry, sorry, Guy, I think we might have had a, a minor glitch. Do you have your slide on your computer there and you could share your screen? I apologize for this. Yes, I, I thought can, we'd have that I together, can, but... Uh, I can try to do that. Yeah, try to do this. So when you do it, if you don't have any sound that makes it easier, but uh, we'll get you just to share your screen. Apologies to everybody here. We had a small, a small glitch there. I don't know. Can you see the my screen? Let's, let's take a look. Do we see it there? Yes, we do. We can see the slides. So if you just turn it to the presentation mode, yes, that'll all be there. There we go. Thank okay. you so much, Guy. Uh, go right ahead. Yes, so thank you. For and apologies okay. for, for that. No, I did send yeah, no, the my slides, apologies. but something, something went wrong. So I'm going to talk to you about ecosystem restoration in a UNESCO designated site. And I want to start first by saying a little bit, what are we meaning with UNESCO designated sites? Well, as you probably know, UNESCO has several um, uh, site-based mechanisms. Uh, on the one hand, we have the World Heritage Sites. These are sites, uh, cultural and natural sites, that are protected under the 1972 World Heritage Convention because of their outstanding universal value for these cultural and natural values. And as you know, this is a, a globally ratified convention, apparently 194 states parties, and it's also one of the biodiversity-related conventions. And today there are 1,154 sites inscribed on the World Heritage List in 167 different countries, of which 257 are specifically recognized for their natural values. Then we also have biosphere reserves. These are uh, 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 listed under the Man and Biosphere Program, which exists since 1971 and is this year celebrating its uh, 50th anniversary. And these sites are focused on reconciling the conservation of biodiversity and sustainable development. And today, there are 723 sites in 131 countries. 
And then we have the, the new kit on the block, if I can call it like that, the global geoparks, which are sites and landscapes of international geological uh, significance that are also managed uh, for protection, education, and sustainable development. And today we have 169 sites in 44 countries. And together these sites uh, cover, uh, are present in all parts of the world, as you can see from this map. And they together also cover a, a very important area, 10 million square kilometers, which is uh, roughly the size of uh, China. So it's a, it's a very important set of sites to, to work with. Uh, I want to talk to you briefly on uh, a study we did on, a, on one of these uh, subsets of sites, the, the World Heritage uh, Sites, where we looked at uh, forests areas uh, present in World Heritage Sites and the carbon fluxes happening in these um, uh, sites. And this is a study that we uh, released just before the COP started, which looked at uh, carbon fluxes uh, from 2001 to 2021 and uh, using uh, uh, satellite images to look at uh, uh, changes in the, the forest cover. So uh, we have of the 257 natural sites that we have uh, inscribed, there are 220 sites that have uh, forests that are important, uh, have important forest areas. And together, these sites uh, cover 90, uh, 69 million hectares, which is roughly twice the size of Germany. So we have very important areas of forests on the World Heritage List. And uh, not only uh, in surface, but of course, these are also very significant uh, area, uh, forest areas for biodiversity. We know we tend to have the most important um, um, uh, uh, forest sites on the World Heritage List in the different ecosystems of the world. And the carbon study we did uh, concluded, and this is, I guess, not very surprising, concluded that these sites are very important uh, carbon stores. Uh, the, the study estimated the, that 13 uh, gigatons of carbon is stored in uh, these sites, uh, in the uh, above ground biomass, but also in the root biomass and the soil. And um, to give you an idea, this, this carbon uh, volume uh, exceeds the carbon of uh, Kuwait's uh, uh, proven oil reserves. And if it would be released, it would be 1.3, the, the, the global uh, total annual CO2 emissions. So these sites are really important carbon, carbon stores. They're also significant in, in absorbing uh, carbon. Uh, of course, most of these sites are mature forests, so they are perhaps not uh, uh, the highest in, in terms of uh, uh, absorption per hectare, but because of the size of the, uh, these World Heritage Forest areas, they do absorb approximately 190 million tons of uh, CO2 per year, which is about equivalent to half of the annual emissions from the UK. So I think these are the good news and perhaps also not uh, uh, so much surprising news. But I think what is interesting and, and perhaps more, um, more uh, frightening is that actually um, uh, these uh, 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 forests are also starting to release uh, more and more carbon and uh, because of uh, forest loss. We tend to think that the World Heritage Sites would be the, the best protected, protected areas in the world. But nevertheless, since 2000, uh, according to the analysis from the, the satellite images, uh, 3.5 million hectares of forests were lost inside the, the World Heritage Sites. And that is uh, um, uh, similar to the size of Belgium. And so that means that also emissions linked to this deforestation have increased over the past 20 years. And in fact, uh, one of the really surprising uh, uh, results of the study is that we found that 10 sites were actually, uh, over the past 20 years, net carbon sources rather than, than car carbon stores. And, and some of that are really sites uh, that, that we would think of as, as important uh, uh, vehicles for carbon storage, like the tropical rainforest areas of, of Sumatra or the Leo Platano Biosphere Reserve in, in Honduras. Of course, these sites are also inscribed on the list World Heritage in danger, so it's not a surprise that these sites have uh, challenges, but nevertheless, we were uh, surprised that they actually had turned over the last uh, 20 years into uh, uh, net emitters of, of carbon. Uh, sites can be net emitters of carbon because of climate change related events. And of course, the most important uh, type is wildfires. We have seen an increasing amount of wildfires uh, over the last uh, decades. And uh, you can see in this graph uh, uh, 
the, the emissions from carbon emissions from wildfires from some of these sites. And we can see Lake Baikal in Russia, where we had important fires in uh, 2016. And then last year in uh, the Tasmanian wilderness and the greater uh, Blue Mountains in uh, Australia. And uh, the, if you look at the amounts of, of um, uh, carbon that are released from these fires, it's really extremely important. Uh, these three examples uh, emitted more than 30 metric tons of, of, of carbon uh, in, in these fires. And that is more than, than many of the countries, more than the national emissions of many of the countries uh, in the world. And then the other reason why, why uh, sites are, are more and more emitting carbon is because of increased land use pressures from human activities linked to deforestation, linked to uh, land degradation. And I think that's where we have the important link to, to, uh, to uh, the need for uh, restoration. And you can see again some examples where in the, the Sumatra or Rio Platano, but also Virunga National Park, you can see that there has been important uh, forest loss, which has, has uh, uh, resulted in important carbon emissions coming from these sites which we would expect to be actually sequestering carbon rather than emitting carbon. So uh, in that sense, we feel that UNESCO designated site can, sites can be a very important opportunity for ecosystem restoration. This, uh, this study was done on the World Heritage sites, but I think you would, would find very similar results if you would look at uh, the biosphere reserves. And uh, there is an opportunity to restore core areas of these sites that have been uh, degraded, but also these sites have important buffer zones and so often also important surrounding forest uh, landscapes. And uh, if you see what is the situation in the site, it is, can be expected that, that uh, it's actually, uh, uh, the pressure is higher in these buffer zone and the surrounding landscapes. So, so these sites can be really an, an important focus for um, uh, restoration activities. Also because uh, we do monitor these sites through the UNESCO uh, programs with uh, the existing governing mechanisms we have in place, like for example, for the World Heritage Convention, we have the, the active monitoring uh, mechanism that uh, follows up on the state of conservation of these sites. And also there is a long tradition of working with local and indigenous communities and other stakeholders for the conservation of these sites. And we are also not starting from zero because uh, in fact, a lot of work is already being done in uh, ecosystem restoration in many of these sites. There was a recent survey done looking at all the biosphere reserves, which uh, show that 60% of the biosphere reserves are already invested in, in ecosystem restoration. So to conclude, we think that uh, ecosystem restoration in, in UNESCO designated sites can be a really win-win situation for both biodiversity conservation and for addressing climate change. A win in terms of climate change, because it will help to uh, safeguard some of the most important carbon stores, uh, um, uh, the carbon uh, that is stored in these UNESCO designated sites. It can also increase carbon sequestration by restoring the uh, ecosystems uh, in the sites and in their buffer zones. And as we all know, um, this um, can also bring other natural solutions for mitigation and adaptation. For example, if we think of uh, um, uh, mangroves, uh, they are important mechanisms to also protect uh, people from uh, 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 some of these uh, weather events. And at the same time, by investing in these sites, we will also uh, realize important, um, uh, an important win for biodiversity because these sites tend to be the sites, they are recognized for their, as for their global importance for biodiversity. And so, uh, uh, ecosystem restoration and working towards better protecting these sites will immediately also produce important biodiversity benefits inside the site, but also in the wider landscape. If we can do ecosystem with restoration in the wider landscapes, we will help to restore buffer zones. We will help to uh, uh, provide other additional benefits like improving the integrity of the sites and also improving uh, connectivity and other um, issues. So uh, we think that it is an important uh, potential for using these uh, UNESCO designated sites for restoration. And uh, UNESCO is one of the partners in the, the, the decade. And we look forward to work with uh, all our states parties, all our member states and other organizations on this. Thank you so much. Applause for Guy Debonnet.
Thanks. I mean, it seems to me that this network of World Heritage Sites represents uh, uh, an important uh, you know, set of case studies and activities for very practical examples across ecosystems and relationships with people with those ecosystems uh, to deal with restoration and have it respond to these various challenges. So, so, Guy, we're looking forward to seeing how these things unfold during the decade, and it'd be good to have reporting back from UNESCO on a regular basis uh, to see the results of these different activities. Thanks so much. So we're going to come back now uh, to here in Glasgow for our next speaker. Uh, David Cooper, the Deputy Executive Secretary of the Convention of Biological Diversity, uh, is joining us. Um, he's uh, going to talk to us a little bit uh, about the first draft of the post-2020 uh, Global Biodiversity Framework that's being negotiated and developed right now, uh, and then also a little bit on the Forest Ecosystem Restoration Initiative. So, so David, there you are, and there's a clicker there for you. If the clicker I just handed you, that's yours for your slides. You get a, a custom device to do the slides. Thank you, is this working? It's all yeah. set, go right ahead, David. Good, and actually before diving into the um, post 2020 framework, I just want to say a few things about the general approach to looking at ecosystem uh, restoration under the convention. Of course, the convention itself makes provision for um, ecosystem restoration and rehabilitation and recovery of species. And we had in the current well, I guess not, no longer quite current, but the, in the Aichi targets, two, two um, targets, 14 and 15, with a focus on, on restoration. But I wanted to note that, because we tend to think of restoration as reversing land use change and land degradation, and of course it is, but it's reversing other drivers of biodiversity loss as well. And we're gonna hear a good example later on of you know, work on invasive alien species that um, uh, helps then restoration and recovery um, to take place. But e equally, you know, addressing the driver of pollution or addressing uh, the driver of over-exploitation. So, you know, rebuilding fisheries is perhaps another example of restoration. And we'll also hear later uh, about work in the oceans. So it's important that we, ba you know, we, we maintain this balanced approach. Um, and although the convention has a provision on restoration, and it was featured in the Aichi targets. The attention on this issue, I think, has increased progressively over time, particularly looking at the co-benefits for addressing land degradation, the co-benefits, obviously, for climate mitigation and adaptation, and um, uh, looking at other ecosystem services uh, uh, that come from 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 biodiversity and from uh, natural ecosystems. In 2016, in Cancun, COP, COP13, the parties adopted uh, an action plan on ecosystem restoration. It was called a short-term action plan, but it, really it's, it's still relevant and will have some relevance for a long time. I think it's quite a, a useful document. It sets out some important principles for ecosystem restoration particularly referring back to the ecosystem approach, which contains, in fact, a whole bunch of, of principles that are very relevant. I won't go through them. We don't have, have time. But just to reinforce the continued relevance of the ecosystem approach and, of course, the importance of engaging local communities of, uh, in partic and, and indigenous peoples respecting their rights, being aware that where we're operating with ecosystem restoration, there are people, um, there's, and yeah, all of this needs to be taken into account, especially now when, you know, in this context where we're looking at uh, more resources, which is a good thing, more resources for restoration to make sure that they're implemented in, in, in a good way. And one other thing is, of course, to make sure that they're, in, insofar as they're addressing climate mitigation, that they're additional to um, strong reductions of fossil fuel emissions and not merely a replacement for them. So just some, some general points there. Of course, we've also had recently more and more of a scientific basis with the IPBES report on land degradation and restoration have been finalized in, in 2018. The, um, the IPCC report uh, uh, on land also very important in this regard. And then finally, you know, following a request that, uh, from the initiative, after the initiative of El Salvador and request from uh, the high level segment in, in, uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh in, 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 in uh, COP14, 
we have the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which provides an overall framework, as, we, as I believe you heard earlier. Um, okay, turning now to the... Um, where do I... Uh -huh. Yeah, so turning now to the, um, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, and I'm actually just going to refer back to what happened um, a few weeks ago now in, um, in, in Kunming, which building on what had already been agreed in, in Sharm el Sheikh, clearly sets out the ambition for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework to halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity, to, put, to bend the curve, to put biodiversity on a path to recovery, um, and then foreseeing uh, an improvement, um, a significant improvement so that by 2050, we're living in harmony with nature. And of course, you can't do this without restoration. So that, I think, is an important um, sort of context. Then that's reflected in the goals also of the, of the first draft, which envisage um, recovery of all three dimensions of biodiversity, ecosystems, species, and genetic diversity. And with regards to ecosystems, looking at a 15% increase by 2050 in the area of basically areas under native vegetation, natural, natural ecosystems. Um, of course, to get there, you need to both reduce loss to its minimum and, in, and invest in, in restoration. And that figure there of the 15% in goal A, which I should have um, put up here, will be the net effect of those two. And it's envisaged that a milestone of 5% by uh, 2030, which is actually very ambitious, I think, but um, um, if you look at the baselines, but um, uh, 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 that we've already turned the curve clearly, um, I mean, a net positive uh, by 2030. Then if you go down and look at some of the um, specific targets, the actual restoration target is looking at a 20% at a uh, increase in restoration by 2030. We have to think very carefully about these figures and also think very carefully about potential perverse messages we're given because if you've got a 5% net increase and a 20% um, investment in restoration, you know, we don't want to be licensing, so to speak, continued um, loss of ecosystems. So I think we need to think very carefully as those uh, numbers are, are finalized. I just want to point out now, and picking up what I said earlier about the other drivers of biodiversity loss, all the other targets here are really quite relevant to restoration as well. And I, I say if, we, if we're investing in uh, uh, combating pollution, invasive alien species, over-exploitation of, of, of um, of wild species, all of these will also help uh, recovery and, and restoration. Spatial planning, target one, will be an essential context for restoration to happen if we're going to, to get the biggest gains. And of course, some of the other targets in the framework um, are really essential in addressing the underlying drivers. Um, uh, those about valuing the benefits from ecosystems, uh, about um, reducing subsidies that are harmful to biodiversity, that are driving um, uh, land uh, conversion and degradation, and, and, and so on. Um, briefly now, just turning to some of the more um, practical areas that the CBD Secretariat is, is working on. And I'm going to just make one or two points and then we have two speakers following that will dive into um, some of the details uh, from our, uh, two speakers from among our, our partners. Um, you, 
thanks to funding from um, the Korea Forest Service, we uh, um, have been able to work with a number of partners, including established uh, partnerships like the Global Partnership for um, Forest and Landscape uh, Restoration, through the other partners of the Collaborative uh, Partnership on, on, on Forests, um, including in particular FAO, um, on, on developing tools to support um, restoration and also capacity building activities. We've held a number of workshops um, over the, the years and prepared some resources which you'll see presented actually in the next two presentations, so I won't go into them, but um, some decision support tools for identifying perhaps where some of the opportunities for restoration are that can give the biggest, co biggest benefits for biodiversity and for climate while taking into account limiting factors, um, and some uh, online uh, uh, e-learning resources. We'll hear about those in the next two presentations. And then finally, looking ahead, we expect to do, continue some work um, on, um, through Ferry in, in, in continuing to hold some, some workshops and developing technical materials. Um, further work on We, we Plan Forests, which again, we're going to hear about a little bit in the next presentation. Um, and then perhaps looking ahead and anticipating a target on ecosystem restoration in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, looking at what sort of report we might have to assess where we are in relation to where we agree we should be, um, depending on the final shape and, and negotiations of the post-2020 framework. Um, so um, those, those are the things I wanted to, to say. And again, just reinforcing I think this holistic view um, that we should take of ecosystem restoration, um, not just forests, not just trees beyond uh, these ecosystems, or important as they are, and looking across um, marine and freshwater uh, uh, ecosystems as well as terrestrial. Thanks, David. Thank you very much, David. A round of applause for David Cooper, the De Deputy Executive Secretary of the Convention of Biological Diversity. So thank you very much, David, for giving us that outline of all the different directions uh, for ecosystem restoration the Convention has been working on and will continue to work on. I think it is also important to point out, uh, as you did right at the end there, that there are just many different kinds of ecosystems where the restoration activity has to be carried in, and we'll hear a little bit more about that later on. Uh, our next presenter is uh, in Rio de Janeiro. So uh, uh, Bernardo Baeta Neves Strasbourg is at the Pontificale Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, and he's also the executive director, uh, executive director of the International Institute for Sustainability. And so Bernardo's going to talk to us a little bit. Uh, I've got here the optimizing the outcomes of ecological restoration. So Bernardo, if you're with us, go ahead and speak. The floor is yours. Thank you, David, and thank you, the organizers. And I'm really sorry for not being there, but greetings to you from the birthplace of the conventions. So I do have a PowerPoint. Uh, shall I share from my side? Or? Let's see. We've we we've got it here, so that's fine. I'll click through for you. Um, let's see here. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So I'll be talking to you about uh, a strategic approach to restoration planning. We do have a platform called Plangea, of which uh, we plant forests is part of. Uh, ecosystem restoration provides multiple benefits, but also can incur multiple costs. And these crucially vary uh, considerably across space. And so identifying areas where these benefits can be maximized while the costs be minimized will increase the chances of restoration success and its positive impacts. Our tools are flexible enough to integrate multiple criteria chosen by decision makers, which is quite crucial in the restoration context where they can be multiple uh, and, and sometimes conflicting interests. And we can incorporate those multiple criteria in a quite a customizable way. We're also very precise identifying the optimal mathematical solutions for the uh, decisions made by the decision makers. And crucially, we're also able not only to generate maps, but crucially to uh, measure the impacts of each of these uh, priority areas could generate. Uh, next, please. 
we did on behalf and on, on um, to support the CBD's post 2020 uh, global biodiversity framework, we did perform the first global priority uh, ex areas exercise for the CBD, and we included over 20,000 species, covered all major ecosystem types, over almost three billion uh, converted hectares. Uh, next, please. As part of the results, oh, just before that, a word of caution, uh, these are global priorities, so priorities from a global standpoint. Uh, benefits from restoration, and crucially their cost, vary also across scale and groups of beneficiaries. So uh, global prioritization exercises can better capture uh, biophysical and some economic aspects. Next, please. But it is crucial that they are complemented by uh, other exercises at more local level, they are able to incorporate the preference of stakeholders. Uh, next, please. Uh, these results were published in the journal Nature last year. Thank you. Uh, next, please. And so these are the first results. If we were to select uh, the priority areas for restoration, based on uh, biodiversity criteria alone, these would be the priority areas from a global standpoint. The darker shades of red are the highest priorities all the way to, to blue. As we can see, the usual patterns apply, the biodiversity hotspots in the tropics. But interestingly, we do have top global priority areas for biodiversity uh, in terms of restoration, ranging all the way from Baltic Sea Islands to Tierra del Fuego in Argentina. Uh, next, please. If we were to focus on carbon, uh, these would be the priority areas. Uh, here we do have the tropical, but also other wet uh, forests and also wetlands that you can't really see that much on these maps. Uh, next, please. If we were to focus on avoiding uh, conflicts with agriculture and minimizing opportunity costs, we would move to the more um, dry areas of, of the world. Uh, next one, please. But probably what we want to be doing is focusing on all of these at the same time. And our algorithms are capable of incorporating all these criteria simultaneously, which is different from stacking them over each other. And these would be uh, priority areas for multi-criteria uh, restoration with multiple benefits being maximized while costs are being minimized. Next one, please. One thing that really jumps out as a, as a key conclusion from our uh, study is the importance of spatial prioritization. So if we're to look here on the y-axis, we do have the benefits in terms of avoided extinctions, while on the x-axis, we do have different uh, potential global restoration targets. So as David mentioned, we could have 5%, 10%, 15%, and so on and so forth. And these are different ways to prioritize in, 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 in space. As we can see, for the same area target, let's say 5% global restoration, uh, we could have benefits to avoiding extinctions ranging from 4% all the way to 43%, just depending on where we focus the restoration efforts. Next, please. It's also crucial to highlight that uh, having the uh, units in place, we can address and assess the trade-offs and highlight the synergies. For instance, we can see here that if we were to focus on the first map, the one on only focusing on biodiversity, it would deliver about 70% of the potential benefits for carbon or climate mitigation. Uh, if we were to focus on climate mitigation, we would only achieve 61% of the potential benefits for biodiversity. But if we were to focus on both of them simultaneously, we could achieve over 90% of the benefits for, for each of them. It, including costs in the equation gives us a 13-fold increase in cost effectiveness. Next one, please. Here, uh, an important message, and in particular for, for this pavilion and this convention, um, it's the importance of international cooperation. 
uh, drawing on previous exercise uh, with uh, red, for instance, under the NFCCC, we can see here that if countries were to achieve, say, a 15% restoration target within their own borders, we would miss out on quite a bit, the areas in red, of the global restoration priority areas. So there is a major scope for win-win cooperation where overall costs are reduced and impacts are maximized, of course, always respecting national sovereignties and uh, prior and informed consent. Next one, please. This is also about the cost effectiveness of restoration for climate mitigation. Uh, we do have uh, most of restoration can be done uh, below $20 per ton of CO2 and quite a lot, uh, around $10 per ton of CO2. Next one, please. And next. Uh, our tools, uh, decision support tools and data are available on, on these links. Uh, interactive tools, or you can also download country-specific data. Um, next one, please. And I leave you with my conclusions on the screen, highlighting for this convention, the major contributions that restoration can have to climate change mitigation. If we were to restore 30% of converted lands in priority areas, we'll be talking about uh, removing from the atmosphere 49% of the CO2 that has accumulated there since the Industrial Revolution and while delivering massive benefits for other uh, global goals and sustainable development. Thank you. Uh, thank our uh, supporters and the partnership with the CBD and all of you. Great. Thank you very much, Bernardo. A round of applause for Bernardo. Thank you very much. Uh, I've seen some of this uh, this data before, actually, Bernardo's talked about, and I think what's fascinating about this presentation is it does show with real data uh, the possibility of achieving multiple benefits across the different conventions. Uh, however, there's a caution there that it does need to be a strategic approach that's data-driven in terms of looking at where activities need to be, what the different outcomes are, and so that you can negotiate and navigate trade-offs. And of course, the aspect of international cooperation is also very, very impressive too. I like the cost of the idea that it was a low cost per ton of carbon removal. So Thank you very much, Bernardo. So we will continue our travel around the world. Uh, and we'll talk now about some other tools. Uh, that's the other thing, too, is Bernardo, note that he gave you the link for the tools you could use for the data for that. So the next tools is we're going to turn to uh, Devon Goad, who is uh, an e-learning and a capacity building associate uh, of the Nature for Development program of UNDP. Um, and uh, Devon is going to talk about the self-paced course on ecosystem restoration that was put out by the Convention on Biodiversity and UNDP. I remember us launching that uh, a little bit while ago. So. Uh, Goad, are you with us there? Go ahead, and uh, you've got the floor. Hi, thank you everyone, and I hope you're all having a great day. My name is Devon, and I work for the UNDP's premier e-learning program, Learning for Nature. I support content development and curricula, curricula development. As you can see here, we operate in four languages. We have over 35,000 participants registered on our platform and growing. And to date, we offer 126 unique e-learning opportunities, including MOOCs, self-paced courses, webinar series, podcasts, and so much more. But what I'm really excited to tell you about today is the self-paced course on ecosystem restoration. This course was developed through successful cooperation between the CBD and the UNDP. We launched it just two months ago and the curricular framework for this course is heavily based on the short-term action plan for ecosystem restoration, also known as the STAPER. It was a, a CBD COP decision in 2016. And so just like the STAPER, our target audience is government officials, but this course is absolutely free and open to everyone. And our main objective is to teach the skills and provide the knowledge needed to create a blueprint for ecosystem restoration, whether this is at local level, national level, or international level. And so because it was so heavily based on the short-term action plan, the STAPER, we developed eight modules from that plan, which I'll dive into a little deeper. So each of these modules consists of between two to four lessons 
This is where learners get their theoretical knowledge on restoration. We then developed worksheets, and this is templates and questions and tangible examples of how restoration can be applied in their context. To further localize the context, content, excuse me, and make it more practical, we also collected 60 some odd case studies and growing. And these are organized by each model module so that learners can go back and share best practice examples, find successful restoration initiatives and so on. To test learners cognitive learning, we developed one quiz per module, so eight quizzes in total. And now if you don't mind, I'd love to share the trailer for the course. In just one generation, we've come a long way in improving people's lives. But the health of our ecosystems hasn't kept pace with this progress. It's time to reverse the damage and heal our planet. Turning things around will take a global movement, a movement catalyzed by the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Over the next 10 years, every concerned citizen will work to prevent, stop, and counter the effects of environmental degradation on every continent and in every ocean. Become a part of Generation Restoration. Register for a free course on ecosystem restoration offered by the United Nations Development Program and the Convention on Biological Diversity. In this five-week course, you'll begin your journey towards creating a blueprint to renew natural resources and biodiversity based on the short-term action plan adopted by countries under the Convention on Biological Diversity. This course will teach you to develop a step-by-step -step ecosystem restoration roadmap. Finally, you'll join a community of practice committed to transformative change for a sustainable future for all. Don't miss your chance to make an impact and contribute to the achievement of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Get started on your tailored pathway to restore our world Registered today. Thank you. And so, as I mentioned, the you're still there, Devon. That's okay. As I mentioned, great. Keep going. <laughs> as I mentioned, the course has been live for two months, and what really speaks to the momentum of the movement and the excitement around the decade is that this is the most, uh, the highest level of registrants that we've had for any self-paced course. And we continue to receive interest um, and requests from learners to have the content available in French and Spanish. And if you recall, one of our key objectives, our key learning objectives was to provide knowledge on ecosystem restoration. This is, we're looking at self-reported knowledge of ecosystem restoration before the course. So we were having 10% of our participants have excellent knowledge, 17 with a very good knowledge, and 30% good knowledge. What are we seeing after they've taken the course? A significant improvement in users' understanding of key restoration-related concepts. 44% of learners are now saying they have excellent knowledge of ecosystem restoration and 40% a very good knowledge, which we are so thrilled about. We also asked learners, what do you plan to do with the skills and the knowledge gain? And another really exciting result is the, uh, the most common thing we're seeing is that learners are going to train others in their local community. They're going to spread the knowledge, which is so exciting and we think there's a lot of potential for knock-on benefits in that. The second most common thing we're hearing from learners is that they're going to create an action plan for ecosystem restoration. And 
learners as well, they're saying some of the cross-cutting themes they're saying is that the course is concise, well-organized, and locally relevant. I'll just quickly read two testimonies from learners. The course represents a gold mine opportunity for capacity building and an excellent course for everyone seeking to develop restoration and climate adaptation proposals for indigenous and marginalized communities. And with that, I invite you to register for the course yourself. It is free, it's open to everyone, and because it's self-paced, you can adapt the learning to your own schedule. It's flexible, and you can even pick and choose if you're short on time what you want to learn. Thank you for your time, and feel free to contact me if you have any questions about learning for nature or our course. Great, thank you very much, Devon. A round of applause for Devon, thank you. Thanks so much. So I, as I was saying, I remember the launch of this course, and one of the things that's impressive is that if we're getting this decade off to a start, uh, the fact that we've already got these kind of capacity development tools on the ground and implemented right now uh, is very, very impressive. And also the, the, the significant uptake uh, for them is also really impressive as well. So that, that's good to see. We'll have to see again, just like I was thinking earlier, hearing about the results from the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, it'll be good to see how this course is adjusted and tuned uh, as other users uh, move forward on it. But it's a way uh, to move forward. Forward. So thanks so much, Devon, to you and your team, uh, and also well, to my colleagues at the CBD who helped put that together uh, as well. So we're coming back here to Glasgow for our next three speakers. Um, so the first one that we'll have here is Patience. Patience Naamata, who works for Fair Ventures Worldwide. Uh, she's based in Stuttgart, but uh, Fair Ventures Worldwide does work in Indonesia and Uganda, she says. Uh, uh, and so she's going to talk to us about how the work at, uh, at Fair Ventures feeds into the ecosystem restoration agenda. Patience? You have the floor. Thank you. Um, patients from Uganda, while everyone talked about the policies, the frameworks, the courses, we are on the ground. We're on the ground and um, we feed into the efforts uh, of the Ugandan government, into the restoration agenda. And uh, we work with the smallholder farmers in the rural areas. The reason we do this is um, we realized that the biggest part of the population in Uganda relies on the environment primarily for their subsistence and livelihood. And uh, for the most part, they are not consulted when it comes to all these processes we, no one knows about the climate change conference here. If you asked any of the people I work with down there, no one knows this. So if we are not getting their views, how do we plan to, 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 to have them be part of this process? So at Fair Ventures Worldwide, what we do is, um, we have gone down to the grassroots we have realized uh, where the problem is, and we call upon um, the policymakers, the funders, to take typically from us. Uh, we are working with the basic, I mean, the people at the bottom of the economic ladder who basically live on their land. So if you're not going to provide any alternative for them, for their livelihoods, how do you expect them to, you know, engage in restoration? So what do we do? Um, we have engaged them um, in reforestation programs, but re restoration programs that are tailored to meet, to suit their kind of environment, their kind of um, status. We deal with indigenous species in agroforestry systems simply because um, agro for these indigenous um, species of trees are convert compatible with agricultural systems. Agroforestry is, um, in my view, well, with the people we work with, uh, is a system, an old system with a new name. 
this is what they have practiced all their lives, what their ancestors have practiced. Now we've put a name to it and we've put a tag. So they don't see anything new. So how do you make that work for them? Twist it, make it productive, make it earn for them. Then it makes sense. Otherwise, just singing agroforestry, restoration, and everything does not sell because it does not sort their needs. So we have programs that um, we have engaged these farmers in. We um, build for them community tree nurseries where they produce these indigenous species. You won't believe it that the average person will not be able to afford five pieces of seedlings, which are about one cent or less. They can't afford that. He would, he would rather buy uh, some beans to take him through the, 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 the day or the week than use it on a useless tree. You know what I mean, where they are coming from. So we have introduced um, systems where we give them agricultural input. We give them tree seedlings of indigenous species that suit their systems. And we encourage them to um, practice this uh, agro, agroforestry using the indigenous species. While they wait for the trees to grow, they can still grow their crops. We advise them on how they can space these crops with site match, we tree uh, species and crop match. We take them through a series of farmer, farmer schools that we, that we do regularly, maybe every three months to six months, depending on the availability of funds. And we are beginning to see the success of these projects. So uh, coming back to where, we start, where I started from, if you're making policies up here, take into consideration that you're dealing with people who have no alternatives. Provide the alternatives for them, provide the alternatives for their livelihoods, and then they will not damage the ecosystem. Then they will be, they will be incent incentivized to protect and restore the, the ecosystems, okay? Uh, I'll give you an example. Last year only, during the COVID-19 um, lockdown, we were under five months of lockdown in Uganda, and Uganda lost up to 73,000 uh, hectares of, of forest, just one year because people had no alternative. They had no savings, they had no alternatives, they only re, uh, resorted to what they know best, nature. So how can we stop that? So whatever policies we make, we have to make sure we have that into, we take that into consideration that you cannot do restoration if there's no alternatives for the livelihoods of the people at the bottom line. And um, these are hardworking people. All they need is opportunities. When the funders are giving all these funds, they need to take into consideration most, I mean, these are problems that most developing countries uh, suffer from, corruption, which is a very big issue. If you send down the money, only part of it go, trickles down to the last person. So when, you, when you're implementing, when you're designing all these programs, you must take into consideration such aspects. You must take into consideration competition. We are competing with other countries that are at a better level than, than us. So if you're putting the same rules for all of us, it doesn't work. If you're putting the same rules for Uganda and the uh, same rules for Germany, I hope there's no German here. <laughs> it doesn't work. We have to tailor make these uh, programs. We have to design them in a way that uh, matches the situation on the ground. Otherwise, it won't work. There was talk during the leaders' summit, there was talk about 
oh, don't go this way, don't go that way. Why is so and so so much into Africa? We, have, we don't have the luxury of choosing who to deal with. For us, if, if you're willing to give us the, what we need, the capital we need to go into this, there are no alternatives. It's not a choice. If you are going to get funds from GEF, I don't know many of the civil society um, players that have benefited from the GEF funds simply because of the challenges, you know, the barriers to accessing these monies. Even when the monies have been accessed, the competition from the bigger players in the country or the governments, uh, the corruption that takes um, the funds before they reach the, the people. So you must understand when people go that way and not that way. We must learn, we must understand this if we are, if we are going to invest wisely and in the right places. Otherwise, we're going to have situations where um, the people that are actually doing the implementation are receiving or partnering with people that actually will end up dis destroying these ecosystems eventually. You know what I mean? So um, what, what is my call to this session, for example? What is my call to the people that are listening to us? take into consideration the livelihoods of the people. There cannot be any restoration. And I, be, I tell you this, I'm on the ground six months a year. I'm in the villages. There is no restoration that's going to take place if you are not going to uh, support the livelihoods of these people by creating jobs, by creating markets. And by creating markets, we're not talking about global markets. We're talking about supporting them, supporting the national economies to absorb, um, to absorb the, the levels of, of, of economics that these societies, these small communities uh, are able to fit in. Um, so in conclusion, I would say we need partnerships with everyone. We don't need exclusivity. We need partnerships that are, um, are, are all inclusive. So, um, like I said, understand when we go that way and not that way is because we are looking for livelihoods. And if you take this into consideration that the barriers that um, stop us from accessing these funds and, 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 and not being part of the global, you know, uh, processes, then that way we shall have achieved, um, you know, what we are aiming at. We are all aiming at restoring, um, restoring the, the, the ecosystems. Uh, in the last three years that we have worked in Uganda, for example, we have worked with um, now about 11,000 farmers on their smallholder farms and we have planted in the last three years up to 190,000 trees, indigenous species. And this is only a tip of the iceberg. We can do more, but where is, you know, we need support, but where is the support going? Put the money, send the money down to the grassroots and not to no, 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 not to the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I offend anyone, not to the courses, <laughs> not to the, you know, if you take me to class, you're not teaching me anything. I already know what I'm doing. So these courses, like you said, I need a computer, I need internet. These people do not know that. If you're providing technology systems, make te technology systems that are compatible with um, the levels of, of the people we are working with. If you put it on the internet, they won't see it. They can afford only phones that use USSD systems. Make technology that suits them. Otherwise, you're making uh, solutions of the developing world, 
of the developed world for the developing world, and it won't work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So thank you. The presentation reminds us that this global activity we're talking about and all this great capacity we're talking about, which we've got to, to data and strategy and all that, this has to be activated at the local level. And so therefore, like a lot of the things I've been hearing all the time here is that it's about equity. It's about the needs for livelihoods uh, of people who are right there on the ground in the ecosystems. And thank you very much for patience for re reminding us that if we're going to have any action on this, if we're achieving sustainable development, if we're improving the livelihoods of people, that's where ultimately we need to make sure it's taking place. So thanks. Thanks very much. Very good. Uh, we're going to move next to looking at another example. We're going to zoom in on the eradication of invasive alien species as a form of restoration. So, Shanna, you've got some slides for us too, I think, don't you? Here, so here's the clicker, and I'll, if you can, I'll pass it on to you. I would also invite, if you want to see the screen a little bit better, if you move your chair just a little bit over there, because otherwise you'll have to crane your neck over. So, Shanna Challenger is uh, with the Offshore Islands Conservation Program. She's the coordinator of the Environmental Awareness Group, and she's from Antigua, Antigua and Barbuda. That's what I saw on your badge, right? Exactly. So, Shanna, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Just trying to balance between the lights and actually being able to see the slides. <laughs> Um, I point here. No, you point just point, point in. Just here? Top okay. Top button. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you again for the invitation to present. My name is Shanna Challenger. I am from Antigua and Barbuda, and I am a conservation program coordinator with the Environmental Awareness Group or the EAG. And today I'll be talking briefly about biodiversity conservation underpinning ecosystem resilience for locally led climate action in Antigua and Barbuda. So um, just a little bit about the EAG. We are Antigua and Barbuda's longest standing environmental NGO. We've been working um, in conservation for over 30 years. And our tagline is simple, for the benefit of people and wildlife. And you'll see why. So let's take a little trip from Glasgow. We're going on the plane to the Caribbean. And our region is one of the most diverse regions on the planet. It is a biodiversity hotspot. And there are plant and animal species found nowhere else on Earth, including um, the Cicero parrot, the Selenodon, and the Lesser Antillean iguana. And if we zoom in further, we're here in Antigua now. You can feel, you can feel the salt here on your face, right? Um, and within our largest marine protected area, the Northeast Marine Management Area, lies 51 of our offshore islands. And these areas are actually designated as key biodiversity areas and important bird areas because of the wealth of biodiversity found there. Um, they are pretty small to pretty large, so from 0 0.1 to 184 hectares. And nearly all of them have been colonized by invasive alien species. So speaking of invasive alien species, these are the two most prolific ones that we're dealing with in Antigua and Barbuda, the black rat and the Asian mongoose. And these species were sped through Europe European colonization of the Caribbean. And once they got there, just like anybody who visits the Caribbean, they don't want to leave. And so these are the two species that we focus a lot on um, with our ecosystem restoration work. And so with these rats and mongooses, they, like I said, they invaded all of our offshore islands. And we at the EAG, along with our partners, thought if the invasive mammalian species were removed, could the species and the ecosystem actually recover? And so, speaking of species, this is the focus and the reason why we did this um, restoration in the first place. This is the critically endangered Antiguan racer. Um, and this species was once widespread across Antigua and Barbuda, but because of our friends, the rats and mongooses, was actually taken out of Antigua and Barbuda. In fact, it was actually declared extinct twice, accidentally, until 50 individuals were found on the Great Bird Island, which I showed in the previous slide. And so what we found was that only 50 Antiguan racers remained on the planet. Um, it was actually dubbed the world's rarest snake at one point, And most of them were actually maimed by black rats. And so the tails of the snakes were actually bitten off, which is where their reproductive organs are found. So you had a bunch of sterile snakes unable to reproduce on the islands. 
And so how did we get rid of these um, invasive alien species? Um, through eradications. And this is what is in the DNA, really, of the EAG. Um, and we do this by cutting trails across the island um, and putting down bait, poisonous bait, within the home range of rats, which is about 30 to 40 meters. And every day we check and replenish these bait stations um, and stay, yes, intense. We camp over on those offshore islands for about two months, checking and making sure that every single rat gets a little piece of the bait. <laughs> and so what happened once we did this eradication? How did Great Bird Island change? And so you can see this picture in 1995. This is a fixed point photo, which is a way that we kind of track the difference um, when we've done our ecosystem restoration. And if you look at that same spot in 1995, and in 2012, you can see the change in diversity and composition of the vegetation once the island was cleared of the rats. And in addition to the changes in vegetation, of course, the Antiguan racer, its population increased by more than 20-fold to the point we were able to go from 50 individuals in 1995 to over 1,200 to date. And we've actually been able to relocate them to three other offshore islands. And although the snakes were doing really well, we realized not only were they doing well, but also the nesting seabirds were increasing in their number. For example, these cute brown noddies here as well as other endemic wildlife, such as the Antiguan spotted and knoll pictured here. And so, to date, since 1995, the EAG has successfully restored 17 of the offshore islands through this method of invasive species removal, with major benefits, as I said, for the benefit of people and wildlife. And we, we decided, you know, why not challenge ourselves further? My last name is Challenger, after all. And so <laughs> we decided to go to the third island of Antigua and Barbuda, which is actually Redondo. It is closer to Montserrat, but it's a part of Antigua and Barbuda. And this island was actually, um, in 2009, called the Caribbean's highest prior priority island for restoration. And the EAG, we thought, we know how to do this thing. Let's tackle it. So let's show you, let me show you what Redondo looks like when we found it. A little different from what we're accustomed to doing, but um, you can actually see the tree, the one tree <laughs> that was left on the island. Um, and we wanted to do the same thing again. If invasive mammals were removed, could the species and the ecosystem recover? And so, on this island, you're probably wondering, what species are you talking about, Shana? Nothing could possibly exist over there. But despite the way that Redonda looked so desolate and literally crumbling into the sea, it was still a KBA and IBA, so it was really important for nesting seabirds, such as this little mass booby family here. We have globally significant populations of them over there, as well as three species of critically endangered reptiles found nowhere else in the world, including the Redonda tree lizard, a very attractive male on the screen, um, as well as the Redonda ground dragon and the Redonda pygmy gecko, which is very new to science and we actually only discovered in 2009. And so, how did Redonda get that way? Um, the rats, again, the perfect invaders, they hunted the reptiles and they would kill the nesting seabirds that were over there. And in addition to the rats, we also had a population of feral goats that had been left on the island. And so you had the tag team effect of the rats eating everything and the goats ripping the vegetation up from the roots. And so again, if we could remove these invasive mammals, could we see a difference in the species and the ecosystem? Let's play this video and see. So again, this is how we found Redonda in July 2016, right before I started my job. We wanted to get, you know, one last look of what the island was looking like. So you see there, it is, looks completely uninhabitable. Um, and our team actually stayed over there for two months, putting down rat bait every 30 meters. We even slingshotted some of the bait and had to do helicopter drops as well. And this is within a couple of months of us removing the invasive mammalian species. Um, this is all natural. We did not have to do any replanting or anything. The island literally said, just take away the rats and the goats and we can do it. We can take it from here. <laughs> and so, as you can see, um, the impacts were really great, um, including the populations of lizards, which um, increased by threefold and sixfold. And of course, the general fall in predation because there were no more rats. 
And so this is, again, another fixed point photo showing you one spot in 2012 versus one spot in 2020. Um, we've had land birds revisiting the island. We've had an increase in the number of invertebrates, so more food for the lizards. And all of this has been naturally, naturally happening. And so my final point, my final takeaway from this is that one, conserving and restoring ecosystems is crucial for tackling the climate crisis, especially in this UN decade of ecosystem restoration. Secondly, the eradication of invasive species can build resilience against future introductions, especially in small island developing states like ours. And lastly, the fact that the local NGOs on the ground, like the, EA, the EAG, um, we are the ones that are pushing forward this conservation action and we need access to the technical and financial support that's available to continue doing this work on the ground. And with that, I thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Wow. It's, I mean, the, the visual representations you have of the results are just really quite remarkable. And it's amazing how, yes, the simple removal of an invasive species produces all these other, these other parts. So uh, great. Well, thank you for giving us that example. Excellent. So uh, we're, we're definitely we're running along. So we won't have time for questions. But the, the last presentation we'll have will be from Elisa Morgera, who's a professor of global environmental law. But she's also the director of the uh, UKRI's um, uh, GCRF1 Ocean Hub. So we're going to hear about ocean restoration. Elisa, if you want to take that chair over there so you can see the slides. And I think I'll take the clicker back from you. Good. Thanks very much. So we've seen invasive aliens, and now we'll see about restoration in the marine setting. Yes. Lisa, go ahead. Thank you so much. Really a pleasure to be here uh, representing a group of over 130 researchers from the marine and social sciences, humanities, law, and arts. Um, we're working together um, as part of the One Ocean Hub, which is really... Um, challenging researchers to work together uh, with coastal people and decision makers from the local to the international level um, to bring together and learn from each other and from different voices and knowledge systems um, with a view to supportive, inclusive and integrated ocean governance so that people and the planet can flourish. Um, and so I'm presenting today work that really my colleagues in South Africa at Nelson Mandela University, and particularly the deputy director of the One Ocean Hub, have been doing um, for a while in Algoa Bay, uh, South Africa. So if we go on to the next slide. South Africa is, uh, Algoa Bay is a biodiversity hotspot, and it's an incredible, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I have to do that. <laughs> I have too many tools, sorry about that. Um, it's a biodiversity hotspot. It's also really interesting in terms of oceanography and weather systems, um, and unfortunately has been severely impacted by climate change, including experiencing severe floodings, weather events, storm surges, and crippling drought. Uh, at the moment, there's currently only 11% of available water in the dams for the bay. Uh, but as you see, there's also very exciting um, social, cultural, and economic systems at play, really amazing ecotourism, international sports, as well as fisheries and ports. Um, and so opportunities to look at how we can look at blue economy and ecosystem restoration together. Um, so I'll share one uh, project that was specifically um, focused on restoring um, an estuary ecosystem, but really looking at the integration of coastal marine freshwater. And as David was saying uh, in his presentation, tackling biodiversity loss drivers. So in this case, we're focused on um, uh, water quality due to industrial discharges, heavy metals, nitrogen, and phosphates, which were negatively impacted on, on salt marshes and submerged seaweeds that were contributing to carbon absorption. But at the same time, the, the difficulty in accessing fresh water were part of climate change adaptation for the local communities. So the work was very much uh, based on biomimicry, so using natural solutions, natural filtering systems to clean back the water, including from the start uh, the local communities, including fishers, uh, working very much together with um, scientists, um, and trying to restore a multiplicity of ecosystem services that were linked to the estuary. And that included not only access to fresh water, uh, but also restoring human health, particularly children and women, were negatively impacted by having access, by being exposed to marine pollution uh, and cultural services. So the area is used for spiritual and religious uh, practices, both for the Sangoma uh, religious rites and also for christening for, uh, for the church in, uh, in the area. 
um, and contributing also to subsistence fisheries that was negatively impacted both by the uh, pollution in the river ecosystem and the marine ecosystem. Uh, and together with this, um, we also developed um, an app that was really supporting both um, smart approaches to governance. So any user, officer or resident would be able to look up relevant legal instruments to either apply for access to water or to, um, to check whether there were infringements to the approaches that were taken for ecosystem restoration and protection and to monitor and share information for law enforcement as well and, and contributing to also uh, scientific monitoring. Um, and some of the laboratories were actually placed within communities. So what was also really important was to take what we've learned in that local action and think about where the policies and the legal framework were disconnected and not really supporting that action across other ecosystems. And so what was crucial was really the realization that we needed to include the land and freshwater interface with the marine environment into the marine spatial planning process. And South Africa is leading in developing marine spatial planning, but as many other countries is facing a lot of legal and administrative administrative disconnections in terms of looking at holistically all the ecosystems that are connected and the ecosystem services that are connected. Um, and within that, really making the ocean central, both as part of the water cycle, but also really looking at how circulation system and upwelling in the ocean were determining the climate, which in, uh, in turn were, was supporting or negatively imp impacting on agriculture on land. Um, in addition, it was also really important, again, to make another link to climate resilient cities and realizing that for how much work we were doing on the natural ecosystems, some of the, um, of the bottlenecks were actually due to urban infrastructure that was preventing uh, and contributing to um, the pollution in the estuary and in the marine ecosystems. And so very much linking the work across and really thinking rural, urban, coastal, uh, marine and land. Um, as part of this work, um, my colleagues in South Africa were also able to develop really incredible, innovative approaches for participatory science and action. Um, we've heard at the start of the event today, Chris talking about how to engage across systems and sectors. And here, what my colleagues did was developing um, a dynamic model together with different sectors, from tourism and fisheries, and starting from their experiences of the changes they experienced due to pollution and climate change impacts starting from their stories first, and then finding the science that was supporting and complementing their understanding both of the issues and possible solutions. And then by bringing that together, modeling uh, potential solutions, and uh, developing a visual interface for users to understand what were the levers of change and the opportunities, um, entry points, as well as winners and losers of one path or the other. Uh, but in addition to that, there were also arts-based approaches um, using photography and having local and indigenous knowledge holders to add to the marine spatial planning, the cultural dimensions and other knowledge systems and really combining all of that again back into marine spatial planning with a view to really not limiting to a one static understanding of space, but really bring those diverse voices, knowledges and changes across space and time. And so I think our key message here is that the ocean is still lagging behind in terms of ecosystem restoration. Uh, it's great that we have so much uh, going on in terms of land and forest, but we need to do more on, on the ocean and the land-ocean interface. Um, and there's reasons why we haven't been maybe bolder uh, yet. And that has to do with the gaps we have in ocean science and the fact that we still don't know enough about deep sea ecosystems and ecosystem services and the connection among those ecosystems. But we have good tools. Uh, we're starting to see how researchers themselves need to change and transform to support changes in policy and action on the ground. And so one key message I think for us is really to thinking about the opportunity the UN decade for action on, on ecosystem restoration is happening at the very same time as the UN decade for, for ocean research. And we need to bring ecosystem restoration and its needs centrally within the decade for ocean science, but equally making sure that the ocean science uh, contributes and far, um, allows to further the integration of the ocean in ecosystem restoration. Uh, and maybe just to close that in our own research we're using, particularly using the interactions between human rights and our different dependencies on ecosystems to understand um, 
who's winning and who's losing, what are the approaches, and how we can look at research also from a human rights and ecosystem-based um, approach perspective. So thank you so much for this opportunity, and hopefully uh, many of us may, may find new partnerships moving forward in this direction. Great, excellent. Thank you, Lisa. A round of applause for Lisa. So uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating also that despite these gaps in ocean knowledge, the example you're citing is how you're able to work with a variety of stakeholders at the local level to, to have this, this, this interactive process to identify knowledge needed, to identify the science that served it, and to maybe identify the gaps as well. And your last comments about the role of human rights, I think, talks back to this whole, the whole foundational element that we also heard from, from, from patients as well, is that if we're doing this work on restoration, I mean, this is about work for us, for human human beings and well-being and that interaction and that the human rights, the question of equity, the dialogue that we establish is part of what we have. So thanks very much. Thanks. So we've gone a little bit over time and also the next event, the health event is happening pretty soon. So I'll have to bring it to a close. Uh, but um, you know, all of the participants here, you've got their names. Uh, they're on the website. We'll, we'll have this thing available so we can continue this dialogue over the next weeks, months, and years on through the end of the decade. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to our panelists who are still connected online and followed us. Everyone be safe, be well, um, and thanks so much.